I am Daniel Minty, a cognitive behavioral therapist, teacher, and writer. Making New Year's resolutions amounts to one of America's great national pastimes. About this time of year, one in two of us are resolving to be different in 2022. Our number one resolution relates to physical health, followed by weight loss, followed by changes in our eating habits, followed by personal growth and development, which is followed by mental health and improving the quality or duration of our sleep. Well, the best laid plans go off to rye. Nine out of 10 of us will fail in our resolve. One in four of us will fail by January 8th. Why such a dismal track record? And what can we do to improve it? The science of goal setting sheds light on these questions, as well as on this important aspect of our clinical work in general. First, some definitions are in order. Self-determination is the adaptive regulation of attention, cognition, emotion, and behavior. Willpower is the effortful repression of an impulse. And habits are automatic behaviors triggered by external cues. Good habits place us in adaptive behavioral patterns. Bad habits keep us in patterns of maladaptive behavior. What do we know about the relationship between our habits and our quality of life? Research consistently shows that good habits more strongly correlate with positive life experience than does willpower. Research also shows that self-determined people actually utilize less willpower than others and experience greater behavioral automaticity, that is, unthinking positive behavior. When most of us get into our cars, we don't think before fastening our seatbelts. Placing ourselves in the driver's seat triggers an automatic response that most of us would consider to be adaptive. There are other benefits of good habits as well. Studies consistently link good habits with reduced reactivity to distractions and increased adherence to goal-directed activity and long-term behavioral change. Some lifestyle benefits that come to the self-determined include better academic performance, higher incomes throughout life, better physical health, and better relationships with others. So what are the errors we make on the road to self-determination? We might call the first error, just say no. This would be an example of what's called avoidant goal setting. And it creates pressure in the direction opposite the goal. Consider this instruction, don't think of a pink elephant. Instead, we'd be better off by figuring out how just to say yes, thus engaging in what is known as approach goal setting. Approach goal setting creates pressure in the direction of the target behavior. Consider this instruction, think of a pink elephant. The second common error we could call just do it. Now at first blush, this appears to be an approach-based strategy, yet it often fails for two reasons. First, it's likely a hidden should statement, and shooting on ourselves is seldom a sustainable motivational strategy. 
Second, just do it likely fails to meet other important goal setting criteria. That is, it likely lacks specificity. What will I do? And when will I do it? And where? It likely lacks measurability. And if we aren't measuring progress towards a goal, the likelihood that we will move towards it goes down. It may well lack acceptability. That is, is this behavior something I'm actually willing to do in a consistent way? And finally, it may not be realistic. This behavior may simply not have a place in the big picture of our current lives. A final error we might make lies in the opposite direction of just do it. This error would be that our goal is too granular, too disconnected from the rest of life. Goal setting science recognizes two categories of goals, subordinate goals, that is what we will do and how we will do it, and superordinate goals, also known as core values. Why are we doing this? Linking subordinate and supraordinate goals raises the probability that will sustain behavior in the direction of our core values. This linkage can happen in many ways. I was once working with a patient who was very depressed. His subordinate goal was to actually get out of bed when the alarm went off and start his day. In support of this subordinate goal, he put pictures of his children who were not living with him at the time at his bedside. When the alarm went off and he reached for it, the next thing he saw were the faces of his loved ones. He found this very supportive of his goal to reset his relationship to sleeping and waking. I regularly experience both kinds of goals in my own life. For instance, we have a recycling bin on the back patio. My subordinate goal is to place recyclables in the bin. Now, sometimes it seems like a long trek from one end of the house to the recycling bin. In different such moments, I hold in mind my goal of passing on a planet to my grandchildren that's more like the planet that was passed to me than unlike it. The probability that I'll find the motivation to make the trek and recycle a particular item goes up. Research suggests that holding both categories of goals in mind also makes us more relapse resilient, willing to pick ourselves up and keep moving in the direction of a superordinate goal, even if we drop the ball on the subordinate goal front. Researchers have been looking at the role that mindfulness practice can play in living an intentional life. Practices such as Zen or yoga enhance our capacity for self-determination by making us less reactive to our internal and external environments. We learn that triggers need not trigger us, that impulses need not be followed. By building the muscle of open awareness, we're actually building the capacity to live intentionally, to live self-determined lives. I hope that you found this information helpful. If you have, consider subscribing to our channel and joining our weekly online training community at All Things CBT. All of us here wish you and yours an intentional, joyful, and self-determined 2022.